Well, welcome. We're excited to have you here, whether you're here downtown at the downtown campus or you're watching online, wherever you are, we're excited that you're with us. Uh, I'm particularly excited as we start this new series today, Third Person. Over the next six weeks, we're going to dive into the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity that I think often gets overlooked. So I hope, are you excited about learning, just diving in? Uh, we're going to, the truth is every series has a little bit of a different goal. Okay, now every time we preach, anytime we open God's word, we want to learn to walk closer with him. But under that umbrella, there's, each series has kind of a different goal. Some are about actually changing our behavior. They're about teaching us uh, some principles from scripture that we're called to live by, that set us apart, right? Others are called about, change, our, their goal is changing our hearts, aligning us with the heart of God so that our heart beats along with his heartbeat, so that our heart breaks for the things that break the heart of God. Uh, and then some are about changing perspective or thinking. Uh, they're, to, they're to get us to view things differently. Go, oh, I never thought about that. This series is all about our perspective. Uh, if you misunderstand the Holy Spirit, then you're not, if you don't get who he is and what he does, your whole view of faith is going to be just a little bit off. Because the Holy Spirit is critical to God's work in our lives. In fact, everything that God does in us and through us, he does through the power of the Holy Spirit. So if we're missing our understanding, if we miss the Holy Spirit, the odds are very high we're going to miss part of what God has for us. Does that make sense? So uh, let me start with a story. Uh, this is a story I've shared from many different perspectives because it's a big part of my life. But eight years ago, I had a climbing accident. I fell 60 feet and I broke my pelvis front and back, fractured at five other places, and they tried to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Uh, I was in Rapid City Regional Hospital for a week and, and then they realized they just couldn't fix me. So they sent me to Denver because it's one of the leading uh, pelvic hospitals in the, in the country. And uh, when, I was at, um, when I was at Rapid City, hospitals have regulations about like, don't over-medicate, don't create dependencies. You know, they got all these rules and regulations about how you give medication and this and that. Air transport regulations are a little different. In air transport, there's only one regulation. Keep the patient comfortable. Now, I don't know what they gave me, but I was comfortable. Okay? I don't remember the flight. Um, I think I told a six foot five, 300 pound man that I loved him. Um, ladies, I'm sure this is very similar to an epidural because those are the exact words my wife said to the anesthesiologist. I love you, man. You know? So I understand that like, I was vaguely aware of my surroundings and I was comfortable. Okay? I think that's how we think the Holy Spirit works in our lives. We read in John chapter 14, verse 16, that Jesus has been resurrected. He's leaving the earth. He, he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to be your comforter. He's going to be your advocate. That's absolutely true. That happened. The problem is it leaves us with a false view of the Holy Spirit where we get in our heads, if I'm a Christian, the job of the Holy Spirit is to keep me comfortable. And that is just not the truth. So let me pick up my story. Uh, we got to Denver. I went into surgery to repair everything that was broken. They gave me medication before surgery too, but the goal of that medication was not to make me comfortable. The goal of that medication was to knock me out, and I'm thankful for it. Now, I want you to see what happened here. Zoom in on this. I was in surgery for 10 hours, okay? For 10 hours, somebody else was at work inside of me, and I was completely unaware. You see the picture? That's how I think the Holy Spirit works. See, we often talk about the spiritual life and we talk about what God is going to do for us and we, we assume that God's role is to do stuff for us because he sent his son and his son died for us and all this and God, God's grace is something he's given to us. Rarely do we talk about what God, what God wants to do inside of us. The, the truth is that God wants to do amazing things in you and through you through the power of the Holy Spirit, this third person of the Trinity but for a lot of us, I'm going to tell you right now in your life, the Holy Spirit is working and you just may not be aware of it. There is a spirit at work inside of you right now, even if you're unaware. And the truth is, uh, rarely does a church talk about the Holy Spirit. The evangelical church uh, tends to give very little focus to this at all. And there's a couple reasons. And, and let me just be honest with the first one. We don't know that much. Um, like, we give tons of attention to the Father. You know, we worship Him. He's a creator, and, and He gave Jesus uh, to us. And then we, we talk about Jesus a lot because He died on the cross for my sins, and the cross is obviously central to everything that we do. But the Holy Spirit, we don't really know much about it. You even go back to the original church creeds. 
And they didn't have much to say. In fact, let's look at the Apostles' Creed. This is what the Apostles' Creed says about Jesus, okay? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Those are all things we believe about Jesus. If you're an evangelist, okay, that, we're good on that. Now watch how the Apostles' Creed addresses the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's all it says. Even the Apostles' Creed, we're still going, I don't like fully understand this. The second reason I think that we don't talk much about it is because we're scared what might happen. Holy Spirit can also be translated Holy Ghost, which really is a poor translation, but you combine that translation with our lack of understanding and then this idea that we have in our heads from somewhere that the Holy Spirit is just this wispy, ghost-like figure, right? And suddenly I'm not that interested in learning more about the Holy Spirit, right? And we, we find churches going, okay, see, if people learn about the Holy Spirit, they might start leaning into the understanding of the Holy Spirit. And have you seen those churches that really focus on the Holy Spirit? They're a little crazy, right? And so we're like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to open that can of worms. I just don't understand. And, and so here's what I think happens to us. We go, okay, if God works for us, then we can leave him at church. But if God's spirit starts to work in us, that's going to mess everything up. And I'm not really ready for that. So as a result, I think we treat the Holy Spirit like inspector number five. You know what I'm talking about? Gentlemen, <clears throat> you go to the store, you try on a new pair of pants, put your hand in the pocket, and there's that little piece of paper. And it says inspected by number five. And you go, I wonder who this guy is. What does he even inspect on my pants? You know, and you start wondering, is this guy real? Well, he must be real because the paper's in there. Then you find yourself going, oh, I'm kind of thankful for number five. I mean, I can't imagine what would happen if I tried uninspected pants. Like what could have, what tragedy could have occurred if I tried on unexpected pants? And so then you start going, thank you, inspector number five. And you know that inspector number five is out there somewhere, but what do you do with the paper? You ball it up, you throw it on the ground, you forget about it, right? Because inspector number five has no bearing on my life. Now listen, I think that's how we treat the Holy Spirit. I know he's out there. What he does is important. I'm thankful for it, whatever it is. I just don't really know what it is. And the result is, for most churches, the Holy Spirit has no impact. It's not relevant to our lives. Uh, A.W. Tozer says, sadly enough, in most churches, there is little thought of the Holy Spirit. Tozer goes on to say that if the Holy Spirit were to withdraw his influence, 95% of churches would keep going just as they always had. I don't want that to be true here. May that never be true here because, listen, the Holy Spirit is fundamental to our Christian faith and belief. We believe in this thing called provenient grace, uh, which just means that God's grace goes before us. Pre comes from the, la uh, it's from the Latin. Pre means before and venire means to come. And so the idea is that before we ever come to Christ, the Holy Spirit's out there pulling and drawing us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, we read, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Like Christ is already doing his work before we believed. And that's just how God works. And that's part of what the Holy Spirit does. He's, he's drawing us. Listen, if you know Jesus personally, if you call him your Lord and Savior, that means there was a point in your life where you were far from him and you were drawn to him until you made a, a decision for him. That drawing is the Holy Spirit. If you're growing in your faith, if, if you feel like you're maturing in your faith and, and you're developing deeper spiritual convictions, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. If you've been in a fight recently with someone and you were able to reconcile, to make up, that wasn't you. You're not that good. That was the Holy Spirit, right? If you were patient, and it's unlike you to be patient, that's the Holy Spirit developing that in your life. If you've been listening to a sermon and, and been like, man, I feel like the pastor's talking right to me, or, or if you've been reading a scripture and a passage is just popping off the page at you that you've read a hundred times, but this time it's sticking out to you, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. If you're in the midst of a tragedy and, and you're just crying out to God in your pain, and you begin to experience peace in the midst of those circumstances, that's the Holy Spirit. And that's what we want to dive into over the next six weeks. We're going to explore the wonder and the work of the Holy Spirit with the goal of just drawing closer to God. So today, we're going to look at Holy Spirit essence. 
the very essence of the Holy Spirit. And this is going to be a little bit like uh, Holy Spirit 101. It's going to be quite academic. You know, get out your number two pencil. Don't worry, there's no test. Uh, but uh, we're going to just dive in and we're just going to like academically begin to lay a foundation and understanding of the Holy Spirit. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, if you didn't bring your Bible and you want one, just raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. We'll be on page 699. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, just keep this one. It's our gift. And if you're on your smartphone, go to Uversion Live Events and you can find all our notes there as well. But 2 Corinthians 13, page 699, uh, talking about the Holy Spirit can be tough because there's not a passage, like one passage you can go to and you're like, this is everything you need to know about the Holy Spirit. And then it's like in one passage. It's more like a bomb went off and the Holy Spirit got spread all throughout Scripture. You got to kind of like pick up all the pieces and put it together to get an accurate view of who the Holy Spirit is. And so today we're going to look at one of those pieces. First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Let's read it together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Okay, now this is written probably like 55 AD from Macedonia and Paul is writing to warn the Corinthian believers that the church is being infiltrated by false teachers. And you say, don't believe everything you hear. That's the scenario. This phrase is actually the benediction. It's the end of the letter. He's wrapping things up. He's saying goodbye. And he's like, hey, don't, this is what I want you to remember. And the reason I focus on this one passage is it's written in what's called Trinitarian form, which means that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all mentioned. There's only a handful of verses in the entire New Testament that mention the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together in one verse. And so this is a great thing to look at. And this is this idea of the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity actually never appears in Scripture. It's just a word that we've used to understand. Uh, the church father Tertullian is the first one to use this word. He kind of coined this phrase. And it's implying not that there are three gods, or not that there's one God who just shows up in three different ways, but there is one God in three persons. Wayne Gruden in his book on systematic theology puts it this way. God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God, and there is one God. Well, thank you, Wayne Gruden, for nothing, right? Uh, <laughs> here's what I think about the Trinity. I think the Trinity is something we know, but we don't get. Is that fair? Like, we know that we, we, it's all over Scripture, but we don't fully understand it. Now, the truth is we're more comfortable with certain parts of it, right? God the, uh, God the Father, we're very comfortable. For God loved us the world. He sent His Son. The scripture says God is love. Jesus, uh, the, the, um, the grace of Jesus we're completely comfortable with. It, he died for my sins on the cross and all of that. But the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that's something that um, we, we struggle a little more with. Fellowship is the word you might have heard. It's koinonia. And basically what that word means is participation. In other words, the Holy Spirit has a role that he wants to play in your life which implies that if you miss the Holy Spirit, you might miss what he's trying to do. You see that? So we want to understand who is he? How can I know it's him? What's his voice like? So um, let's dive into the Holy Spirit's essence. Um, everyone in this room has a picture in your head, an image in your head, whether it's accurate or not, of what God the Father is like and what Jesus is like. Whether they're accurate or not, you got it, right? Like we got uh, things throughout history. Michelangelo's Finger of God painting, you know, uh, beautiful. We, we understand that God's reaching down to us. Beautiful painting. It just falls short. We end up uh, with this view of God, like God's the guy with the long white beard, you know, sitting up and uh, looking down from his throne, and he might have some lightning bolts. And, and, and this is our picture of God, unless, you, unless you've seen Bruce Almighty, and then you just think God is Morgan Freeman. Um, <laughs> so that might be your understanding, but either way, like we've got these pictures in our head. Jesus, that's easy. There's pictures. Well, there's paintings. And, and everybody seems to, you know, we got movies, Jim Caviezel. Oh, Jesus looks like Jim Caviezel. Of course he does. And he's always like this GQ guy with a perfectly trimmed beard. We forget where scripture says that Jesus wasn't much to look at. We just interpret him in a picture that we, but whether the pictures are accurate or not, the point is in your head, you have some sort of a picture of God, the father. And in your head, you have some sort of a picture of Jesus, the son. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, the only thing we can draw is a blank. We have no picture of him. The philosopher Arius in, in 325 AD uh, tried to describe the Holy Spirit as the exerted energy of God, kind of like Star Wars, you know, the force. These are not the droids you're looking for. Um, it, it's this picture that 
when you feel, quote, the move of the Spirit, or you come to service, you, say, you ever came to a service and said, I really, I felt God in service today. That that's what the Holy Spirit is. Sounds right. The problem is he was a heretic, which means that his beliefs didn't line up with Scripture. In other words, that, that is the Holy Spirit at work, but that's something the Holy Spirit does. That's not who he is. We wanted to understand who he is. And Scripture gives us different pictures like dove and fire and wind and water. And they, they're just trying to help us sort it all out. But, but at the end of the day, we don't have a picture. So we're going to try to do the audacious thing. Instead of trying to go, oh, this is what the Holy Spirit looks like or is like, we're just gonna, I'm going to describe three things today that we know to be true about the Holy Spirit. Three things we know to be true so that we can get a glimpse of, oh, that's kind of what he's like. Okay? So number one, first thing we know about the Holy Spirit uh, the Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit is personal. He's not a, a force or an Im- energy or an immaterial thing. The Bible says he's a being, that he's personal. All the qualifications of a person are as follows. You've got to have a mind. You've got to be able to reason and think and things like that. You've got to have a self-will, an identity. You've got to have emotions. All of these are true of the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me give you some glimpses. Uh, first, he's referred to with the masculine pronoun. You may say, who cares? Uh, But this is important because he's referred to as a he, not an it. Uh, We see that in John 15, 26. I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. He's described with personhood. It's a he. The Holy Spirit also has an intellect. Scripture talks about how he thinks and and has wisdom and a force can't think. An impersonal force can't have wisdom. So he's got to be more than a force. 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, when we tell you these things, we don't use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. He has a wisdom to offer. He also possesses a will. Uh, He can make choices. He can choose to act or not act. He can make determinations. In fact, he looked at you in your life and said, I think I'll give you these gifts. And he makes those determinations. In 1 Corinthians 12.11, it says, it's the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So he's making those decisions. That's a very personal thing to do. And then also he demonstrates emotion. Ephesians 4 says the Holy Spirit can be grieved. In in Romans chapter 8, it says the Holy Spirit groans, that he feels the weight of the sin we commit. 1 Thessalonians tells us, don't quench, don't resist the Holy Spirit. He can do all these things. He can feel all these things because he is personal. Does that make sense? So that's the first thing to know about him. He's personal. The second thing that we can know about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is God. So let's dive into that a little bit. He's not part of God. He is 100% God in all his glory. He's not God's errand boy. He's not God's lackey. Uh, It's very easy to think less of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's incredibly humble. When you see him in Scripture, he's always pointing to the Father, pointing to the Son. But don't mistake humility for lack of value. He is just as much God as the rest of the Godhead. Bill Bright, who's the founder of Campus Crusade, put it this way. He said, the Holy Spirit's God. He's not an it. He's not a divine influence. He's not a fleecy white cloud. He's not a ghost or a concept. So again, let me give you some snapshots. Uh, He has a relational connection in the Godhead. He has a relational connection in the Godhead. He's referred to as the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. They are in relationship with one another. He's also described as having divine attributes. In other words, things that are true only of God are true of him. For instance, we're called to baptize people how? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? Hebrews 9 talks about how he, the Holy Spirit, is eternal. Ephesians 1 calls him the spirit of wisdom, 1 Peter 4 calls him the spirit of glory. John 14 calls him the spirit of truth. Uh, Hebrews 10 calls him the spirit of grace. Over in the Psalms, in Psalm 139, it says that he's omnipresent, that he's everywhere at the same time. These are all qualities that make God God, that are only true of God. And they're true of the Holy Spirit. Also, he's co-equal with the rest of the Godhead. Uh, Here's what I mean. Look Look at our passage again, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, notice, who did Paul start with? The Lord Jesus. See, Paul is 
I, I think Paul did this on purpose. In Paul's mind, he's stressing co-equality. We, we've done this, and tell me we don't do this. In our heads, we say, okay, God the Father is the top, and then Jesus is the Son, and then the Holy Spirit comes in third, right? Isn't that kind of what we do? We create this false hierarchy, and Paul says, no, 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 they're all equal. A great example of this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you don't know the story, it's found in Acts chapter 5. It's about a couple who sold a piece of their property, and they got the money, and then they went over to the temple, and they gave part of the money to the church. That's their business. They can do that. The problem was they said it was all their money. They lied about, maybe they just wanted more credit, more clout, but they said, oh yeah, that's all the money, but they kept some money back for themselves. Now, it wasn't wrong to keep money, but they lied about it. And Peter says this to them in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? Now watch this. You lied to who? The Holy Spirit. And you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to who? God. Do you see that? He used them interchangeably. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to God in the same paragraph because they are co-equal. They are one. And so the implications this has that God and the Spirit are one, when God says, I'm going to send my Spirit to live in you, he doesn't mean my Spirit who is the errand boy. He means I am going to send my Spirit. And God comes and takes up dwelling in us. So first of all, the Holy Spirit is personal. Second of all, he's God. Third, the Holy Spirit is an individual. This is where it gets muddy. This is where it gets fun. From the very beginning, the people of God, the Jewish people, were monotheists. In other words, they believed in one God. Okay? That was actually quite unusual at the time. Most everybody believed in a bunch of gods. But the Jews, they believed in one God. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 is probably the most important scripture to a Jewish person. It's known as the Shema. It says this, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. The point is there's only one God. And the Jews in the early church embraced this. When Moses uh, or Charlton Heston went up the mountain and met with God and he got the two tablets with the Ten Commandments, the very first one is, you shall have no other gods before me. You are to be monotheist. You believe in one God. This is a big deal. So you start, st start talking about the Holy Spirit, it's where it gets a little crazy, right? A little mysterious. See, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are distinct, and yet they're one God. And we've tried to explain that and make sense of it. We've done a really lame job. We've come up with things like this. Oh, God is like water. He's, it can be a solid or a liquid or a gas, and it's all still water. Or, oh, the Trinity is like um, an egg. Yeah, it's got a, a, like a shell and a yolk and a white, but it's still an egg. Those are lame. Let's just be, those are lame, right? We try, but we just don't understand. We can't put it in our concepts. L let me explain it this way. Our operations manager, Lisa Morosky, her daughter, Olive, a couple years ago drew me this picture, and I loved it so much I hung it on my door. Uh, it says, uh, from Olive, dear Pastor Phil, you are a best friend. Okay, you can, oh, uh, right? Because that's awesome. Now, in case you're having trouble deciphering this, I'm the tall one. I don't mean to brag. I think the drawing falls a little short, right? I'm a little better than a stick figure. Now, this is how we understand the Holy Spirit. There are diagrams. There are things out there, and I'm going to show you one. It's probably the best one out there, but it still falls woefully short, but we'll still use it to try to get a picture. So look at this diagram. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. You see it? Now, this falls woefully short, but it does give us insight that within the Godhead, uh, this is what we're talking about. Uh, they are indivisible, which means that you can't take them apart, and they are individual. They're of the sub same substance but separate beings. And the reason that this is a mystery is not because it's impossible. The reason this is a mystery is because we have nothing in our experience to explain it. But listen, just because you can't explain it doesn't make it re not real. Just because you can't explain it doesn't mean it can't happen. I, I love how Dr. Wilbur Smith puts it. He says, the man who denies the Trinity will lose his soul. The man who tries to understand the Trinity will lose his mind. We who are finite cannot comprehend God who is infinite. 
Folks, that's the essence of the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the foundation. Again, we're just laying the foundation. He's a real personality, he's God, and he's an individual. And this sets the foundation for where we're going to go in the next five weeks. And so I want to ask you two questions today, and then we're done. And these are in your notes. Question number one, so what? You might be saying, who cares? If I wanted to go to college and learn about I would have. You know, Why are we doing this? The reason we're doing this is because as we begin to unpack where the Holy Spirit is moving, you're going to be amazed to find out just how much he's already involved in your life that you're unaware of. Uh, we have something in our lives called the reticular activating system. Basically, it's the way our brain works with our eyes. So like, for instance, if I buy a blue Honda, before I bought a blue Honda, I never saw a blue Honda, but then I buy a blue Honda and what do I see everywhere? Blue Hondas, right? I just recently started riding motorcycle. Before that, I, was, I didn't notice. Now guess what I see everywhere? Motorcycles. Yeah, because I'm looking for it. So the goal of this series is I want to activate your reticular activating system for the Holy Spirit. I want you to have your eyes open to where the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. That's why this is important. Which leads to the second question. Well, now what? Now what? What what do I do with this? Well, we said some series are designed to move your behavior and your heart, get you all emotional. This one's just designed to change your mind, to change your thinking. So I want you to to go back to Scripture. and Before we dive into the ministry of the Holy Spirit, as you get into God's Word this week, start to look for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. He's everywhere if you're looking for him. Or how about this one? As you pray this week, pray to the Holy Spirit. Listen, he's God. We very openly say, oh, Jesus, would you do this in my life? Oh, Heavenly Father, would you do this in my life? Why would we not pray to the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, guide me, protect me. But we never do this, do we? You can pray to the Holy Spirit. You can have a conversation with him. And and as you do these things, God is going to begin to open up himself to you in all the places that you see the Holy Spirit at work. And in the next five weeks, we are barely going to scratch the surface. But my goal together is to grow, to get to know the Holy Spirit a little better so that at the end of this, hopefully it will change your life and it will change our church. So let me pray for us as we begin this series. Father, I go back to the song we sang right before this and I pray that Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And it's amazing to me that this Spirit of God that wants to work and move our hearts and move us emotively and, and get us to, to respond and react, that it all starts with our minds, our intellect. We have to choose what we believe. And so, Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to you. Holy Spirit, would you help us see that you are indeed personal? that you're active within our lives, moving and helping us, and that every time God works, every time we feel convicted or motivated or called, every time that we grow or learn something new, that's the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us, that you are personal, that you are close. Help us understand that you are not just personal, you are God, that the very Spirit of Almighty God lives within us, and the power that that gives us is unimaginable. And that you would help us respect you as an individual, not as some errand boy for God, but as an individual part of the Godhead specifically designed to live within me. Spirit, may you change our lives as we open ourselves to you. I pray in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.